Hey, everyone. In today's rebuttal, I'm joined by William Albrecht. He is a Catholic apologist. He does a lot of work with Michael Lofton at Reason and Theology, and he does a really good job. I have a lot of respect for him because he's one of the few apologists who is willing to go out there and debate people from opposing viewpoints. He's done a lot of debates. He's debated a lot of the people I've debated. He's debated uh, Dan Barker. Uh, he's got. A, he's more than willing to debate James White if White is going. Is willing to debate him, and so he's done a lot of good research on different topics. And so the genesis of today's episode is that William he emailed me. He said, "Hey, did you check out the dividing line? Uh, James White. Uh, he spent." most of an episode critiquing William on a debate he did on purgatory. And then in the last 20 minutes or so of the episode, he went back to a talk that I gave in 2019, or 2018, I think, I can't remember, a talk on Protestant distortions of the Church Fathers. So I've already done a previous video where I've engaged White on his criticisms of my talk, and so he's continued to go through the talk, and uh, I probably wouldn't have noticed it except William sent the email and said, hey, do you want to sit down with me and kind of do a live rebuttal of James White's critique of your talk? And I said, yeah, that would be a ton of fun. So we did that. So this is, unlike my other rebuttals, this is more of a, a live rebuttal that we did for his YouTube channel. But it was a lot of fun to be able to sit down with him. He's a very knowledgeable guy. Go and check out his YouTube channel. I'll link to it in the description of the video below. And check out what he and other people at Reason and Theology are doing. They're doing a lot of great work. So without further ado, here is my joint rebuttal of James White, who still doesn't like my old talk uh, on, the Pro on the Protestant distortions of the Church Fathers. My joint rebuttal with William Albrecht. Check it out. Yep. The part that he is um, critiquing here, and hopefully you guys can't hear this, an ice cream truck is driving by my house. No, you're, you're clear. We can't hear okay, any Very, truck very good. Um, <laughs> I was talking about early evidence for dogmas like the Immaculate Conception, and an indirect piece of evidence for that is that if, if Mary was preserved from original sin, since Genesis chapter 3 talks about labor pains being a penalty associated with Eve's disobedience and original sin, if we have evidence Mary was spared uh, from labor pains, that is evidence. It's not a full proof, but it's evidence for the dogma that she was that she was immaculately conceived. She was protected from original sin. So, and so, what I pointed to were early sources that talk about uh, Mary being free from labor pains, and then there's also early sources that talk about um, uh, the other children of Mary being uh, children from Joseph's previous marriage, and uh, that Mary remained a virgin, that she was consecrated as a virgin in the temple, and that we find in what's called the Proto-Evangelium of James, or the Infancy Gospel of James, a, a Syrian Antiochian Eastern document dated to probably uh, mid second century, early to mid second century. And so what White is going to do now is he's going to say, although they're, they're, they're using these, uh, non canonical sources and Hey folks, there's problems in these sources. Yeah. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean they aren't witnesses to what early Christians did believe. And now he's going to talk about the problem, the, the problems he sees in them or he thinks they're there. Yeah, no doubt. You didn't put it. Family members and things like that. But a couple of years ago, I remember, and then again, it was only a few months ago, I read through portions of um, the Ascension of Isaiah. We did story time with Uncle Jimmy, and uh, we, we looked at the Protevangelium of James. And in fact, I, I should have grabbed the, the uh, Gnostic Gospels text. It's in on the desk in, in the other studio. But we read through uh, portions of these things to remind us once again of the nature of these sources, the nature of these materials, that they are clearly unorthodox. They are clearly not based upon a, uh, a Christian worldview, that they are clearly influenced by forms of... Well, I think let's stop, let's stop it right there. Um, yeah. Okay, so those are dramatic claims that he's saying. He says that they're, they're not Christian. I would say, well, do these documents, uh, does the, the infancy gospel of James deny 
Jesus's divinity or his humanity. Like that to me would be to say something is not Christian. It would now I would say it's not orthodox. Uh, I mean, it's certainly it's not the church doesn't recognize it as being canonical or inspired. Uh, and I would say the infancy gospel of James, the genre. And so when people read it, you have to keep that in mind. And it's important. It's just like when we read the church fathers, they're not infallible. Some of them have made some pretty bad mistakes. The ones that lost their saint titles certainly did. Yep. Uh, you know, the ecclesial writers, you like Tertullian or Origen. And with these uh, apocryphal sources, we have to keep that in mind. But at the same time, we also get important historical points. So you take like, and it, what's interesting, William, is that sometimes I get Catholics who give me a hard time on the infancy gospel of James because yep. I am partial to the view the brothers and sisters of the Lord are children from Joseph's previous marriage. And right. that's that's the Epiphanian Eastern view of this. Uh, you can hold the Western Jerome's view. I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm partial. And I know some people are, some Catholics are very, very against that view. They, they are. Tell, yeah. and, they, and they tell me, oh, oh, Aquinas rejected the infancy gospel of James. And how could you rely on that? And I tell them, what are the names of Mary's parents? And how do you know yeah. that? Yep. I'm sure you, you, you know, we have feast days for St. Anne and Joachim. That historical Directly detail from there. comes from the it comes from the infancy gospel of James. That's how you know that. So these are these are details that we find there. And so within these documents, I would say the infancy gospel of James, it's genre. It is not a Gnostic text. As he explains it more, I think you and I will be able to break down. I, there's not Gnosticism here. No. Uh, but I would call it Christian Midrash is what I yeah. would call it. So yeah. Midrash is a, a Jewish genre of retelling stories in the Old Testament in a markedly different way to draw us particular points out of them. And they're clearly retold in even a fictional kind of way. And so I think that the infancy gospel of James, it does not perfectly align with the infancy narratives in Matthew and Luke. There are many touch points. There are also differences. So I would say those differences represent a Midrashic retelling but they're underscoring the main points of the canonical narratives, which is that Mary conceived of the, the Holy Spirit, uh, that Joseph is not the earthly, Joseph is not the biological father of Jesus. Jesus only has one father, God, God is his father, and that this is a miracle that has happened for Mary to give birth and that Jesus was born of a virgin. That's what's being underscored here. I would say, William, if you're going to compare it, say, oh, it's a Gnostic treatment, look at what the Gospel of Philip says about uh, the Virgin Mary. It says, uh, Gospel of Philip, it says that it is said that Mary conceived of the Holy Ghost. How does a woman conceive of a woman? Uh, this is nonsense. And so it talks, yeah. and so there it talks about the Holy Spirit being Sophia. It's a woman. This is not what we find in the infancy Gospel of James. So when he says this, yeah, I, I agree. It's not canonical. It's not inspired, but it's not just like complete rubbish either. It provides a framework for understanding early Christian attitudes. Trent, what a great point you brought, number of points you brought up, really, really good ones. And I agree completely. And I was about to get to that point. There, you look at what scholars have to say, they're not going to argue. There's a new, there's a, um, a scholar by the name of Nutsman that has written on the prote of James. And you find more and more Jewish scholars, Christian scholars that do not label it as a Gnostic work. I've heard James White say, well, it's proto-Gnostic. There's not Gnosticism within there. But right. I'd, add, I'd add even more. You're definitely right there, Trent. Here's the amazing thing. You know that Joachim and Anna are the names of Mary's parents. So we know that there is truth. There is some truth, a good amount of truth, preserved within this early Christian writing that comes from a very early period. I want to add another thing, Trent, and, yeah. and then we'll continue watching this. You've heard James bring it up a number of times. He's brought it up multiple times to me as well, and I don't agree. He claims that the Proto-Evangelium is what was the basis for this belief in the early church, right. but I, I don't find that. I look no. at Origen or, or Ambrose, and they don't tell you, well, I believe it because of that document. No, the document, I would say, and this is something similar when you read Richard Bauckham is a Protestant scholar. Oh, by the way, good reference to Mary uh, Knudsen, that, that the, the article she did, Mary yeah. in the Temple, is, very, is a very good treatment of talking about how because people will scoff at the infancy gospel of James saying that Mary was a consecrated virgin in the temple. 
Yep. And, and Knudsen does a good job showing, well, no, there were many uh, female attendants with special gifts and privileges within the Hebrew temple and goes into detail about that. But yeah, when, when we get into the document itself, uh, I would say, well, well, look, when you're saying that it's Gnostic, actually read into the text. And especially when we get into the section when it talks about the birth of Christ, uh, the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, I, I think White really misrepresents what the what the document yeah. is saying here. Yeah. I totally agree. Let me continue with the audio and we'll continue. Yeah. But I, I totally agree with you. Really, really good points there. Gnosticism, early Gnosticism, all the way up to full-blown Valentinian Gnosticism. If you're not familiar with what Gnosticism was, it was the greatest enemy of the Christian church beginning at the end of the first century. Even into the first century, if you're looking at the earliest forms in being warned against in Colossians and uh, first John and, and things like that, but certainly the biggest enemy of the, of the church in the second century. And I will, let me, I'll, quick, quick comment here. Definitely. I would say actually the biggest enemies by the end of the first century and early second were not the Gnostics so much as the, the, the Docetists. Yeah. The Docetists were the ones who were saying, that's what John is saying. Those you're antichrist. If you say Christ did not come in the flesh. Yeah. And correct. so I would say when you read the infancy gospel of James, if there are any exaggerations or embellishments, it's not to promote Gnosticism. It's to counter Docetism. It's to say, yep. no, Jesus, God became man. He really was born. He really dwelled not just in a woman, but was born of a woman. Because the Gnostics would say, oh, yeah, maybe Jesus was in Mary, but his flesh did not come from her body. And the infancy gospel is saying, no, 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 this is really and you read scholars on the infancy gospel of james they'll say no this is, has very anti docetist narrative to underscore the reality of the incarnation that is a really really good point you bring up there and that is a point emphasized heavily by the great saint ignatius of antioch who emphasizes the flesh the flesh of the eucharist right so it's a really really good point that you bring up there uh, i think james is really wrong with that as well and i think what he's trying to do for his audience he's trying to really emphasize how how terrible Gnosticism is, and if, which we agree, of course, we're not arguing, but if you get that in your mind, okay, how bad this is terrible Gnosticism, you, you get that in your mind, and then you, by the time you finally realize that, you've already got it entrenched in your mind, okay, well, does this really come from Gnosticism? The problem is, and we're going to see it in a moment, is that those early fathers the greatest offenders of Christology of the Trinity, you know, they believed Mary was a perpetual virgin. So that to right. me presents a major problem for James' right. position. We've got some of the greatest luminaries of the faith, but let, let's play more. We'll, we'll definitely get to that. As such, the worldview of the creator God making all things central to the Christian faith, Gnosticism denies that. And so you have a, a dualistic system within Gnosticism um and this is plainly seen in these sources and you have this idea of jesus basically beaming in to the world he beams out of mary there's a there's a bright light and when the light fades huh, there's a baby so no birth there couldn't be because in gnostic thought that would make Jesus a part of the fallen physical order. And so right, let's, let's stop. Let, I have to just stop here. Oh, I, let me continue with thought. I interrupted myself earlier uh, <laughs> that you're right. There's the, I see a lot of scholars saying this, Oh, that the, the infancy gospel of James is the origin of the perpetual virginity of Mary. But when you read yeah. people like Richard Bauckham, who is a Protestant scholar, who yep. defends the, he does not believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, but he, he does believe the children, the brothers and sisters of the Lord are from Joseph's previous marriage. As a Protestant, he believes that. Yep. He believes that this belief about the brothers and sisters of the Lord, uh, actually, it, it is the infancy gospel of James, the Proto-Evangelium, is a witness along with other Syriac and Eastern sources. And when you read Origen, when you read these other Eastern writers, they don't cite the the infancy gospel of james it's just one of the witnesses and even the infancy gospel of james takes it for granted that this is yep. just a belief that that people have 
Now, first, the argument he's making, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me. If the, if this was a Gnostic text and it is saying that it's defending the view that Jesus is, um, you know, he's not a part of the created order. He's from the the uh, the demiurge, the pleroma, you know, the, the good God who's purely spiritual. Why would he be within the body of Mary in the first place? Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you just rewrite the story and say that uh, Mary was never really pregnant, she appeared to be so, and that God just became, materialized out of thin air or something like that? Why would you even bring that in? Number two, I would just encourage people to go and read section 19, at least that's how New Advent numbers it, of the infancy gospel. And the way that White describes it, he makes it sound like this is Star Trek. That just yeah. like it describes Jesus just phasing into existence, uh, leaving his mother body, you know, this 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 beaming. Um, instead, section 19 talks about how Joseph is bringing Mary. They seek a Hebrew midwife. Uh, the midwife went away with him. They go to a cave. This is where a little different from the infancy narratives, the sure. house cave. Maybe it was a house built into a cave. That was common at that time. Yep. Uh, and it says, behold, a luminous cloud overshadowed the cave. Uh, the midwife said, my soul has been magnified this day. My eyes have seen strange things. Notice the midrash here. It's taking Mary's Magnificat and working it into what the midwife is saying. But a, a cloud is coming over. Well, what is this a reference to? Gnosticism? No, it's a reference to the Ark of the Covenant. That when the Ark of the Covenant was in the Old Testament, there was always a cloud that followed it. There was a cloud that would settle upon it. And so that's what the author's trying to assert here with Mary. Uh, immediately the cloud disappeared out of the cave, a great light shone in the cave so the eyes could not bear it. Once again, that's that's not Gnostic. Having a great light be present is a common theophany in the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures. There was a great light, a light that shone when Jesus was born in the infant, in the, in the canonical gospels. Yeah. And then it says, a great light shone in the cave, eyes could not hear it, and in a little that light gradually decreased until the infant appeared and went and took to the breast of his mother, Mary. Now, some people read this and say, oh, he was a, he was a two-year-old that walked over to Mary and nursed. Well, that can just mean he was born and he took to the breast. A lot of people would describe childbirth that way. And it's saying there was a, a, a light. This is a, a, a glorious doxa in Greek, a glorious thing happening. And then the child appeared either through the birth canal or whatever happened. But it's not saying anything weird like how White describes it. So I think people need to... Read it for yourself and see if it aligns with James's summary of it. Really good point there, Trent. And and people can read it for free at New Advent. You, and I agree with you. The way that we have the approach of James presented to us by Dr. White is really uh, kind of as a shockingly heretical kind of document that has no value. But you're not going to get that when you read the text. In fact, it has some... Uh, a lot of stuff that you can directly see is being taken directly from the gospel. So you're definitely right about right. that. Uh, but I think I know why, Trent. I know why he is, he's got to do that for the particular reason that any ancient document that would lend credence to the Catholic belief, he's going to do his best to denigrate the value of it. Uh, it really is and, an and unfortunate I, thing. It's an interesting strategy I see among Protestant apologists that – uh, if it's a later church father, let's say after Nicaea, no sweat because they're already corrupted by the Roman system. They'll say yeah. they'll say whatever. But as you get back earlier, you either have to poison the well for the source or you have to just radically reinterpret uh, what they were saying, like with Ignatius of Antioch or, or Justin or, or or things like that, which also these church father sources one source that's interesting is St. Jerome, in his defense of Mary's perpetual virginity, he says that uh, St. Polycarp, Ignatius, Justin, Irenaeus also held to this view. We don't find, well, at least especially like maybe like Polycarp or Ignatius, we don't find as explicit defenses of it, but it's possible Jerome had access to their writings that have now been lost. Yeah. And so and so that one is I, I wouldn't put that as my strongest proof, but I find that to be interesting citation going back really early in the fathers. That is a really, really good point there, Trent. And, and to add to that, I would say that Jerome, uh, there's there's a very clear reason why Jerome is very upset there for people that might know not know the background of that. Uh, Helvidius, 
uh, was an Aryan. We know he was an Aryan monk. We're told that through later history. We're told that he was taught and trained by Bishop Bonasus. So uh, the big problem that we've got here is Jerome is furious because he knows that with a proper Christology comes proper Mariology and vice versa. And he recognizes this is going against the grain of truth, what was taught to them from the very beginning. And what does he then do? He then points out how, well, the early church believed this from the very beginning. Helvidius is clearly wrong. And he then begins to cite sources. Look, we only have a few letters surviving from Ignatius of Antioch. What's to say that Jerome, St. Jerome, did not know of this tradition right. in something we that have we don't We have, have hardly anything from Polycarp. We have a fragment from Papias. Yeah, that's about it. So, um, and, and again, he also provides a defense when it comes to uh, Victorinus by saying, look, that is also being wrenched out of context. The fact of the matter is, we would have had this widespread in the early church if it was such a common belief, if people would have said, oh, well, what on earth is St. Jerome talking about? Because we know very well, Trip, the fathers had no problem voicing their uh, disagreements with one another. Why don't we have a, a, a wide array of them saying, well, look, Jerome is wrong on that. You know, he's terribly wrong. Uh, Mary had other children. You don't find that in the early right. church. Right. We've we've pointed out, if, if you believe in... The perpetual virginity of Mary. What Rome teaches is the perpetual virginity of Mary. That is that she remains a virgin physically in the giving of birth, which means the, the, the child does not leave her body in a normal process of birth. If you believe that, I don't know how you maintain the idea of Jesus, the necessity of Jesus being the God-man to bring about redemption by a sacrificial death. Okay, let me ask you this, Trent, because that, that, I, I've got to be quite honest with you, Trent. I have to be honest with you, brother. That's a shocking statement from James White there. Um, I'm trying to wrap my head around it that yeah. he seems to be saying, so the dogma of Mary's perpetual virginity, we talk about being a virgin before the birth of Christ and after, and there's also the idea of during his birth or in part two. And so I think what White is doing is he, and this is common among Protestant apologists, is they mistake what some saints or other Catholic writers speculate upon the matter, and then what the church dogmatically teaches in regard to it be number one. And then number two, th it's weird, this idea that if I, I, he sounds, what he sounds like, he sounds like a Muslim who would say, Jesus cannot truly be the Messiah if he does not have Joseph as his father, for he would not come from the seed of David <laughs> and make a real nitpicky point out of it. Say, well, no, yeah. he's God. He can be Messiah however he wants with Joseph as his adopted father. Much the same way you're telling me that if the God man, and this is from White, who is a Calvinist, who has a high view of the sovereignty of God. You're telling me Christ cannot be truly God and truly man and have a miraculous birth. And we're not even saying Christ's humanity changed or ended. Those who would take a more speculative view would just say, when Christ was born, he did not cause injury to his mother. How in the world would that mean I'm saying he's not fully human? He's fully God, so he can miraculously do things to he to he. If Christ can miraculously heal people in his earthly ministry, certainly he can miraculously prevent harm to his own mother during his birth. That doesn't take away. So I think it's just a, it's a weird it's a weird argument. But then number two, what I said, or the number one point I say, he has confused you know this speculation like what happened, how was Christ born without breaking Mary's hymen or this or that. The church doesn't have a definitive teaching on that. Uh, Ludwig, Ludwig, uh, if you're German, you got to say Ludwig. Ludwig, uh, Ludwig, you got to. <laughs> yeah, Ludwig Ott, Dr. Ott, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. Uh, this is what he says about Mary's virginity in part two or during the birth of Christ. Quote, this merely asserts the fact of the continuance of Mary's physical virginity without determining more closely how this is to be physiologically explained. The church just says Mary was a virgin her whole life. That's all that it teaches about Mary being a virgin 
during the birth of Christ. After that, there's speculation about what happened, but we're just saying she did not have sexual relations with anyone. That's it. And so he's reading more into this dogma than what, than what the church actually presents. He, he really is reading much more into it. And, and Trent, another thing that I want to kind of toss your way and get your thoughts, because mm -hmm. we have so many incredible early church fathers that definitely said, you know what? Uh, Mary had a pain-free childbirth. And when you hear James White asserting that this then damages the, a very key uh, essential teaching within the realm of Christology, you've got some of the greatest defenders of right. Christology and the Trinity that believed that. As you know very well, Trent, right. you find it in the Tome of Leo, the mark of orthodoxy in the early church at a very council. Um, so to me, it really seems very difficult for me to wrap my head around this for the claim James White is making when you've got so many fathers that believed in that, what do you really, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, what I see, I see the early church squarely against James White here. Right. You, you read St. Ambrose of Milan, for example. So Ambrose talks about how in Ezekiel chapter 44, Mary is typologically connected to the gate of the temple yeah. through which, through which the Messiah will pass. And so it says Mary is the gate through which Christ entered the world, uh, a manner of which his birth did not break the seals of virginity. Uh, there is a gate of the womb, although it is not always closed. Indeed, only one was able to remain closed that through which the one born of the Virgin came forth without the loss of genital intactness. So it talks, their fathers talk about bodily integrity, others that just talk about pain. Now, if white were to say, I don't think, I think he's talking about bodily intactness or injury. Yeah. Uh, but, but even there, there are, what's interesting to me about, about this claim here is that, I think there are people who do give birth and they don't experience really any injury at all. Uh, and there are also people who do experience naturally pain-free childbirth that does happen to people. So this could be the case where if Christ's birth is pain-free or leaves Mary intact, it may be a miracle. It could also be providence. It could be God providentially ordering the world so Mary is like other women who experience this kind of birth. It could be either one, especially if it's providence. Does yeah. that mean, what about people, who, children who have been born through ways their mothers didn't experience pain? Are they not really human? It, it would just be it's an odd argument. <laughs> that is a really good point you bring up there, Trent. It, to me, I find that to be a very poor argument. I don't think it is a good argument, but I think that White, James White is trying to put forth these arguments to really kind of make a caricature of what Catholics truly believe. Like, oh, well, look, they believe in these things that are very odd. And if you follow the logical conclusion of what they believe, well, it leads to all sorts of heresies. The problem is, as you pointed out earlier, masterfully, Trent, is we've got these heresy hunters in the early church and the early Protestant reformers that right. held to Mary remaining a perpetual virgin, her whole life remaining a virgin. So... To me, that is a major, major barrier that James has never been able, able to overcome. And there's no amount, because I've heard him say this in debate before, Trent, there's no amount of Logos Bible software that can help you when the overwhelming consensus is that Mary remained a virgin her whole, her whole life. And you even have fathers, Augustine, Ambrose, Maximus the Confessor, Ephraim, and others that believed Mary had taken that perpetual vow. That vow was found in, in the right. Prote of James. So th there, there's clearly um, a problem when the most ancient view of Mary does not jive with what James believes. And in order to do damage control in it, James is trying to really, you know, kind of denigrate the importance of what the what the church teaches on this topic. As you can tell. Uh, I'm this. I could have done, of course, an entire talk on Mary the New Eve, or yeah. these are examples I have picked to talk about the early trajectory of beliefs in the fathers. Uh, and you see that when he's just at this point, he just critiques, he'll bring up my PowerPoint and just critique something I said about Mary the New Eve and sin as completely beside the point I was making. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. And you're, you're gonna hear. And we'll hear the, the arguments he puts forth, and then we'll we'll touch upon them. But uh, I think the one thing that really, to me, uh, comes across is, you know, I, I guess a little bit um, uh, bothersome is that you're you're giving a talk to a general audience of individuals. You're you're not attempting to 
go in depth, exegete Greek or deal with Latin or deal with the Syriac fathers in depth. You're showing a general teaching here. And he's then trying to show, well, you know what? Uh, not the full context is being shown or what have you. But I really have to be quite honest with you, Trent. Thus far of what I've seen, I don't really see a real refutation of anything from James. Right. No, yeah. All, at best, he can say is that I haven't made a, a, a convincing case. So, yeah, sure. if, I, if I was giving a talk on any one of these subjects, I would have given it differently to focus just on one teaching and back, you know, backlog all the evidence as much as I can. Here, I'm just yeah. giving people a, a sampler platter of how understanding the, the fathers, how their writings are, are distorted, either their writings or what they don't write about gets distorted as if it's evidence. This is another one. William, I find with Protestants is they'll try to say, well, look, Church Father X could have or should have written on this dogma or this Catholic doctrine, but they didn't. So that means they didn't believe it. And that sounds exactly like the mythicists, people like Richard Carrier, people like Dan Barker and, and others who claim, yeah. oh, well, look, Paul doesn't mention about Jesus' miracles. And look at this teaching in Paul. He doesn't cite when Jesus said X, which would have been really helpful for him. So clearly Jesus never said or did any of these things. Uh, no, he may have had, had his reasons or he chose not to cite it. So it, it, I thought about doing, I, should, I almost want to do like a whole book on it, at least a talk on when Protestants act like atheists. And they, um, they do do this from time to time. They, they do it, unfortunately, quite often, Trent. And I think the one thing that um, James White brings it up very often, but I don't see him doing it when dealing with uh, videos that he's looked at that I've done and you've done. He'll claim, well, we can allow the early church fathers to be the early church fathers. I don't see that in James, Trent. I really don't. Uh, in fact, I see quite the opposite. I get the idea that if you don't have a particular father teaching Every Marian dogma, well, you know, we shouldn't be utilizing them. Like you'll hear him bring up in a little bit, make a point about Ephraim, which, by the way, we're going to completely refute that. But right. I find that to be quite problematic when you are, tr you need to realize some of these fathers were literally on the run, like Ignatius of Antioch. We hear, well, why does Ignatius teach th this or that? He's literally on the run. He's going towards his martyrdom. He knows he's going to die. And you want him to write uh, 20 volumes on theology? I, I find that to be irrational. I really, I really, 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 really wonder um, do Catholic apologists, I've got the echo coming back again, uh, do Catholic apologists really want to go here? Do they really? I mean, if, 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 if they know the nature of these sources, if they know what they say, if, if, if they know their background, if they know out, out of what they're coming, do you really want to stand there in front of your audience and say to them, go look at this stuff. Go look at this material. Because there's going to be a lot of them that are going to go, wait a minute, th this material is plainly ahistorical. Well, but, 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 but it's an indication. Okay, but it's an indication. It comes from what? Why? All right, let's pause right here, though. Source yep. This, so once again, this is a double standard because Protestant apologists, when they're defending Christianity and trying to muster facts about the historical Jesus, will say it's not just Christian documents that attest to Jesus being a miracle worker or being born of a virgin or existing. They'll say, look, the Talmud says Jesus was a sorcerer who led people astray. And what if I said, yeah. well, James, you really want to go to the Talmud? Look at all the weird things in the Talmud. And he would say, that's not my point. My point is, in spite of that, it is a witness of these beliefs uh, you know, that are that are ancient about Jesus. The same with Greek critics of, of Christianity, like Lucian of Samosata, for example. So yeah. So I think that that's an interesting double standard in his argument. And then number two, I would say the, the argument is saying, of course, these works are going to have a historical, like anything non-canonical. It's the same we said with the infancy gospel of James. There'll be a historical elements. There will be problem, you know, themes from other kinds of variant Christianities. But I think the scope of the problem is greatly exaggerated. Like if White were to say, 
the ascension of Isaiah and the odes of Solomon are just Gnostic works, for example, if he were to argue that that's just not true. Um, these are works that I would classify as, um, well, it's hard. They're kind of composite works. Uh, and yeah. the composite work is usually that they are Jewish in origin and they're, they're Jewish wisdom literature or they're Jewish mysticism. And in many cases they've had Christian redactors, uh, adding to them yeah. to bring, to bring out, Hey, this has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And they see the value in this. And they want to say, by the way, this was fulfilled in Jesus. And so you have like the odes of Solomon, uh, the anchor Bible dictionary, uh, it says in its entry on the odes of Solomon, uh, that, uh, scholars of the apocryphal works, including I think R.H. Charlesworth, he he has like a he's an editor of like the entire Suda Epigrapha, all of these apocryphal works. He says uh, they're convinced they should that the odes should not be labeled Gnostic, so you can't date it to the late second, early third century. It's more of a uh, early second century work. And the Ascension of Isaiah, uh, there is an anthology on the Ascension of Isaiah by uh, Bremer, Carmen, and Nicholas are the editors. And there's an essay in there that talks about how the cosmology in the ascension of Isaiah of Jesus passing through the heavens. And of course, you know, multiple heavens, that's, that's not Gnostic necessarily. Paul talks about the third heaven, his letter to the Corinthians. Yep. He says that it, it more speaks about this is a kind of Jewish mysticism or an anti-Marcion uh, element to it. So, and I find this with, with White, frankly. In my book, The Case for Catholicism, what White does is that He'll pick out something in a text he finds to be problematic and harp on it. Uh, for example, his treatment of the deuterocanonical book of Judith. Uh, in his book, Scripture Alone, he says that Judith is clearly it's, it's in historical error. And what scholar is going to believe this is just an allegory? To which, in my book, The Case for Catholicism, I cite numerous Protestant scholars who say it is an allegory or it's didactic fiction. Uh, that what Judith just means lady it's lady jew it'd be like if i yep. had a story about how miss america beat up hitler you know it's it's, it's yep. an allegorical piece of work but he'll do this he'll pick these these documents and just argue from common sense and his understanding of the text but not bring in what other scholars have to say because many times they won't agree with him you, you're you're completely right with that trent and it really is a, a massive double standard because he has no problem at times hearkening even to Josephus to, which I don't agree with, but to support his truncated Protestant canon. Um, you know, so the problem is there's a massive double standard when it comes to bringing in works that are uh, not biblical. He will nitpick. He will try to really denigrate their value. But at the end of the day, the big problem that I know notice through everything here, Trent, is the issue that Again, as you brought up, Origen, uh, uh, St. Jerome, St. Ambrose, any of these other fathers, and I recognize Origen as an uh, ecclesiastical writer, not a father, but these figures that clearly taught the perpetual virginity of Mary are not telling the audience or their people that are reading, they're not telling them, we're taking this teaching from the, the Odes of Solomon, the Ascension of Isaiah, or the Prote of James. No, they're clearly telling you this was taught by the apostles. This has been taught, handed down. And the massive majority of them, Trent, they believed it came directly from Scripture, didn't they? Right. And that's the same we have with the Reformers. They read Luke chapter 1, Matthew 1. And they just, and to be frank, I think one reason the, the Protestant change in Protestant belief about the dogma of the perpetual virginity of Mary, I don't know, I would, I would love to do an in-depth research on this to back it up with sources, to, to see where the change occurs, I think when society changes its views of sexual mores to make it seem like a married couple abstaining from sexual relations would be an impossibility or it's something that, you, you know, that society started to elevate sexuality into an idol, even Christians doing it unknowingly uh, away yeah. from the 16th century and you get more in the 18th or 19th century, uh, th then I, I think you start to see people saying, well, they already start with the, the inc that it's incredulous to them that a, a, a married couple would refrain from sexuality, whereas the fathers all the way up to the reformers would start from the presumption, how would you have sexual relations uh, with the, the Ark of the New Covenant? Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt about that. And th that is a really good point that you bring up. 
uh, because that that is an area where if you do do that research, you, you, you've definitely got to put an article out or a video out. Because as far as the early church goes, if you look in the early church again, as I pointed out, when you look at Helvidius, Bishop Bonasus, you find those loudest voices against the perpetual virginity coming from Arianism. You don't find it right. coming from the church, from the ancient church. And then you bring up a really good point. As time goes by, we get to the medieval, medieval era, then we get to the reformers. They all hold to this. And, and you bring up, in my opinion, a fascinating question. Where is the disconnect? And I, I have to admit to you, every time I've debated the topic of the perpetual virginity, the one thing that is literally thrown in my face is, well, how on earth could a couple ever abstain from having these kinds of relations as if it is the most incredulous, impossible thing? And it, and it ignores, definitely... right. And it ignores the patristic and, and early church evidence, especially in, in the Eastern church of married clerics who were expected to practice uh, continence with their wives. Yep. Uh, I mean, even today, married priests in the Eastern church abstain from sexual relations before they offer this, you know, the night before they offer the sacrifice, the sacrifice in the divine liturgy. Uh, yep. And so if you read the early church, this idea of uh, those who have been called to God for the, the vocation of serving the sacrament, the holy orders and the priest, the presbyterate, uh, being a bishop, uh, they were in, in there were married clerics, but they were expected to practice continence. And that was not as, as controversial. Not everyone lived up to it perfectly, but it was still something that was that was normally accepted. Yeah, no, no doubt. In fact, it, it, it you never find any of the fathers um, shocked at this truth. In fact, again, that letter that we brought up uh, earlier, the Tome of Leo, Pope Leo, Pope St. Leo the Great, his Tome of Leo to Flavian, remember, such a monumental writing in church history when we talk about Christology, when we talk about our ancient Christian faith. And Pope Leo... Part of what you find in that tome is believed that Mary remained a perpetual virgin and had a pain-free childbirth. Right. This was really, Trent, here's the one thing that's amazing. This was part and parcel with the Orthodox, tiny O, faith. It was really embedded in the early church. They believed it. They believed it to be biblical, and they believed it to be ancient. Right. Exception and all the rest of this kind of stuff. Um the whole complex and eventually bodily assumption stuff bodily assumption unknown in the early church just just plain unknown and the first times it shows up it's in stuff that the pope says is heretical he didn't say that that was heretical he said that the work itself was heretical which is hardly a high endorsement or something but the point is this is this is plainly not the faith of the early church. All right, let's let's pause here. A few, yeah. all right. So a few points. <laughs> First, I find it almost to be a fruitless exercise to talk about the fathers with someone who would hold a view like like White does, because for him, the fathers can only be an asset, and for me, they can only be a liability. That for him, it doesn't matter that the father that even someone like William Webster. Uh, will say the fathers universally accept baptismal regeneration. That you have Protestant historians will admit, yes, they all believe in baptismal regeneration. Uh, that doesn't phase White one bit. He'll say, don't matter, it's not biblical. I don't care. It yep. uh, doesn't matter that none of the fathers believed in the impossibility of losing salvation. That that, that view was not known until Calvin. doesn't matter yep. to him, because it's what the Bible teaches. So for him, it doesn't matter what the fathers say. But suddenly, I am blameworthy. And, and what White will say is, well, I believe in sola scriptura, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter if a dogma is not found early enough. But my retort would be, well, White, if your argument is, if the apostles taught X, we would expect the fathers to teach X, uh, then it will also apply to your missing Reformed doctrines among them. So worse came to worse. What's worse? To have uh, 
and ancillary, like like the central dogmas of our faith are the the Trinity and especially Catholicism. Let's say the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the sacrament of holy orders, the 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 Theotokos, Mary the Mother of yeah. God. The bodily assumption is a dogma. It's not. It is a secondary dogma. It's not a primary. Like among Marian dogmas, the primary dogma is Theotokos. Yep. That's where all the other dogmas flow from. So what's a worse position to be in? I'm worried about the historical evidence for a secondary dogma like the Assumption, or I don't have historical evidence for sola scriptura and sola fide, and yeah. or for limited atonement, or you know for the core things of what I believe. <laughs> That's a boat I would I would way rather not be in. Number two, I would say he's he's incorrect about this that he claims the first written source uh, was uh, well it, I I forget the the name of the source that is condemned. It's in the Decretum uh, Galesianum. He says that Pope Galesius I condemned this source. First, Stephen Shoemaker uh, probably has written the best scholarly treatment of the Assumption, in my, my mind. Uh, he says, no, we can find ancillary views of this in non-canonical works. One is the Book of Mary's Repose, and uh, he the Ethiopic versions of it, or Coptic versions of it, you could date to the 3rd or the 2nd century. So you find this, uh, but also by the time of Pope Galatius, by the time in, in this time period, you have established feast days. You have yep. this has been entrenched in the Christian community. But the argument he's making is, ah, oh, yes, but but the first, you know, let's say in a papal work, the Decretum Galatianum, which, by the way, is probably a forgery. It's yeah, probably, no doubt. Yeah, it's probably it's probably a forgery anyways. Mm -hmm. But even if it were legitimate from Pope Galatius, uh, he just condemns. He, you're right. He condemns the work, not the doctrine in it. He just says the work is apocryphal. But another apocryphal work in that same list he condemns is the book of the nativity of, of the Savior and of Mary. So it's like, is he condemning the virgin birth? No, he says, look, these are apocryphal works. But it doesn't mean apocryphal works don't have value. What's funny, William, is like if you're saying, oh, you, you're going to you're going to cite from uh, the, the Embassy Gospel of James, the book of Mary's repose. Why would you do something like that? Well, Jude cites from the Book of Enoch. Yep. Jude cites, Paul cites from uh, Greek poets. We even have the Bible itself citing the reliable elements in apocryphal works. So if they can do that, why can't we? Yeah. No, what a great point you make there, Trent. And, and um, you're directly right about that. When it comes to the transitive literature, um, there is nowhere, nowhere, no indi any indication in the early church era that the fathers that are then talking about the bodily assumption of mary are borrowing from the transitist literature there is no indi right. in, no indication and i'd add as well you're right shoemaker has done a ton of work in that field argues that it's very early he also points out that epiphanius saint epiphanius or epiphanius however you want to pronounce it believed in the bodily assumption of Mary as well. So we've got those early documents. And we also have, if you think of Jacob of Seruj, Syriac church father, incredible evidence where he talks about an early church council where he goes and he presents a hymn to Mary. And in that hymn that is presented is a belief in the bodily assumption of Mary. Now, again, where do you, where can you find this kind of scholarship? You can look to the great scholar Sebastian Brock. He's not a Catholic. He's not a Catholic scholar. Right. He's written about this. I've done shows of them about this. He clearly shows it. Or look to the writings of the great Father Brian Daly. Great priest has done incredible work in this field. This is what I wonder, yeah. Trent. Why? Why? And I've got. I want to be fair here. I don't want to be mean or crude. But why does is James not doing? research in the scholarly field on these topics i don't hear him quoting a father brian daly a dr sebastian brock uh, or shoemaker and why am i bringing those names up because they've done a lot of work in this particular field when it comes to the dormition and the bodily assumption of mary i don't see james dealing with scholarly no, I, sources. I think these kinds of arguments like when i've read roman catholic controversy and these other arguments against Catholicism, they're not new. A lot of them are rehearsing uh, stuff from the 19th century Anglican controversies, uh, Whitaker, George Salmon. Uh, that's where I see this stuff. 
and then it's not able to address newer scholarship, which I do in my book. The um, let me see. Let me, <laughs> I might as well do a quick plug for it. Let me <laughs> reach over here and grab it. There we go. Um, well, that's why I try very hard to do in case for Catholicism is to engage yeah. arguments from these critics, but show modern Protestant scholarship that is not polemical. So when you have Protestant scholars who are not interested in the Catholic Protestant debate, but are just doing the research, much of their research actually builds up the Catholic position. You see this with, with Marian doctrine. You see it in justification with the new perspective on Paul. I should say the new perspectives on Paul yeah. of people like E.P. Sanders, James Dunn. Uh, one of them says, hey, the new perspective on Paul theory of justification, it's really close to Catholicism. And yeah. he's a Protestant. And he says that. Yep. By the way, for, for people that may be wondering, Trent, where can they find that book of yours? Where can they find that and get a copy of it? Yes, I would recommend Case for Catholicism, published by Ignatius Press. Uh, I had it. I, I wrote it because I wanted it to come out in the anniversary of the Reformation. So it's, it's for back in 2017. But yeah, you can get it from Ignatius directly or from any anywhere they sell books. Awesome. Awesome. Great. OK, let me let me continue it. And he's going to continue talking about um, those documents. So I'm going to fast forward it right around here. He had not he was unaware of this fact and this fact and this fact from new testament uh studies and things like that that hadn't been done in his day or whatever else but you have to be able to take the good and the bad for a lot of people no nope. if you find someone who's orthodox on this subject then everything you the problem is that creates massive contradiction massive contradiction you're, you're going to find almost no two early church fathers that agreed on every single thing. Okay, let's talk, touch upon that, Trent. I want to maybe um, maybe ask ask you this because that's a really really powerful statement by James. So let's roll it back a little bit. Let's talk about things that we would consider essentials to the faith: baptismal regeneration, the holy mass, uh, salvation, um, things like that. Are we able to find a, a, a massive consensus well, of fathers? It, it depends. Yeah, it depends how you define the term. So first, if by consensus, James means every father testifies to this yeah. and affirms it, then no. But that's only because some fathers don't write about it, either because they chose not to or m maybe they held a, v a variant view on some things and didn't express it. But yeah, if you say, well, you can't get the universal view of the propitiatory nature of the mass because you can't get that language in this early document here or, or, or something like that. Or you have not, the fathers didn't all write on everything. So in order to show there's a disagreement, you'd have to say, all right, you can, you can find a father who directly contradicts this belief uh, versus another. And that is a much harder one to do. Now I will say because of the nature of how doctrine develops, you will have some doctrines that uh, belong to the deposit of faith, but people are growing in their understanding of it over time. Uh, and so you have disagreement about understanding uh, the nature uh, of Mary's personal virtue, for example. Yeah. Uh, so you will have, so on some doctrines, you will have, there is disagreement, and the disagreement is allowed because the church has not ushered in a definition. That the church, what happens a lot for, for dogma to find is that the church lives out the faith and the faith is, is taught. It is lived out in the liturgy. The fathers are a witness to sacred tradition. And gradually there's a coalescing and understanding of how the sacred tradition is lived out and articulated in these dogmas. And then you might get a point where the church will then officially define it, whether it's at an ecumenical council yep. or when the pope exercises his extraordinary magisterium making an ex cathedra definition like with the immaculate conception the bodily assumption so yeah james is right on on some doctrines you'll have fathers that are at at variance as the doctrine is being understood in the church until until it is defined and then after it's defined no you don't you could even argue with with the eucharist and the real presence you could say some of the fathers the way they talk about it you could interpret it as consubstantiation Others more trans. Well, I love the Eastern Church. They use metastoichiosis. They call oh, it yeah. trans elementation to yep. get the point across. But you you see the dispute end after transubstantiation is defined at fourth ladder and in 1215. 
Same yep. with understanding the nature of, of, of the Trinity, understanding how do we understand the nature of the Godhead, the relationship of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Nicaea, Constantinople, boom. You, you're, you know, it, it's over. You disagree. You're, you're a heretic. The heretics are around, but now we know they're, they're on the outs. Yep. But then, so I would say, yeah, there, there's going to be some disagreement as there's this trajectory of understanding within the church, and then the magisterium makes definitions, and that, that closes the door. But then also... No, you do have doctrines, though, that are understood early on and are universal, and even Protestants will, will recognize it. And we've already mentioned uh, several, uh, baptism regeneration yeah. being one of them. I would say infant baptism. The, yep. Even the people you have that are that deny it, only deny it out, uh, like Tertullian, only deny it out of practicality. Because they say, well, sure. you know, if you're going to be sinning a bunch, wait till baptism right before you die. Yeah. But they but they yeah. don't they don't hold that it's not efficacious for infants. Uh, so I would say that that's that's not correct, that some core beliefs. Uh, but even but even look at the um, the beliefs Protestants would hold to like Christology. You have very core beliefs early on, like the deity of Christ. But then other beliefs, let's take monothelitism, the view that Christ has a distinct human and divine will. That's not very clear in the fathers until several centuries later. Yep. So it's not. So I would say that if he says, OK, you got some. Why aren't they? Why aren't all your Catholic beliefs clear? I would say, well, James, why aren't all your Christological beliefs clear or your soteriological beliefs clear? Some are clear and unanimous early on. Others, the church uh, understands the deposit of faith until they get a, a clearer understanding of it. That really good points to bring up the Trent. In fact, uh, when when dealing in mon uh, monothelitism and, and uh, other heresies that would come uh, later on down the line, you don't find a lot of early fathers dealing with that because that's not the heresy of their day. You know, they're not encountering that problem at the particular time that they're writing. So th that is a major problem that James does have. But you brought right. up a really good point when it comes to infant baptism, baptism regeneration. And of course, there, there are many others. But, you know, let, let me be honest with you, Trent. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's say. Oh, another we one would be the, the the authority of the bishopric. The oh, yeah. Apostolic, apostolic succession and the yep. authority of the bishop. I would say that's universal. It, it, it No doubt it is. But, Trent, let's say we can find 30 fathers or 40 or 50 that taught that. We could find 100 or 200. James is not going to change his belief, even if they're unanimous on multiple things, that he's not going to change his belief because his tradition – his Calvinist tradition tells him he's not allowed to believe certain things. Yeah. So he already comes with these. And, and that's emotions. why if he and I were to do a debate, like I am not going to debate him on the perpetual virginity of Mary, for example, right. because we come at the question with very different views about authority. So uh, that's why my offer for, for James White, my offer for him would be because he said, oh, I'm not going to debate this. Or, I'm not going to debate that. My offer for him is simple. I'll do two debates with him. We'll we'll do a debate where he affirms his source of authority, which is sola scriptura, and he can define that however he wants. And then a debate where I affirm my source of authority, scripture, tradition, magisterium, and I can define that how I want to because it's my authority. And then we both we both have affirmative cases to make in two separate debates, and then we do we do that. I think that would be the most fair and the central thing we have to address. That would be the fairest, you no doubt about that. So the challenge is out there, James. Trent is willing to debate, and James knows very well I've contacted him. I'm willing to debate as well. You have people out there, James, that are willing to debate you. The ball is in your court. And so anyone who deals with the church fathers in a meaningful fashion has to allow that level of freedom in analysis of what they're saying. And so um, notice uh, this, this statement here as well. Uh, church fathers compare Mary to Eve, who was also without sin. Now think about that for a second. Church fathers compare Mary to Eve, who was also without sin. Well, she wasn't without sin her whole life, was she? Um, Eve fell, didn't she? Eve was deceived, wasn't she? As soon as you start doing the 
parallel equals identity stuff. All righty. I, I don't, have to, yeah, I don't I think have, he gets to Trent. I really don't. I got to be honest with you. I'm going to hope he's being ignorant about this rather yeah. than disingenuous. I'm going to hope he was just ignorant of what I was doing. Yep. Obviously, that is a PowerPoint, and you have a bullet point. My point is not that Eve was sinless, but it's that Eve was created in a state without sin. Eve came yep. into existence without actual or original sin. And so if Mary is the new Eve, her obedience undoes what Eve does with her disobedience, then we have a parallel there to say that Mary is also created like Eve, but unlike Eve, she does the right thing. And so she does not lose. While Eve lost the grace that God gave her, Mary did not lose it. And so that would be yeah. the typological connection. Now, of course, with typology, it's always not as direct a proof as like John 6, 53 through 57 on the Eucharist or, you know, Matthew 16, 18 on the papacy. But when you see also how the fathers understood this and uh, went with this and understood that. The, and the point I made in the in, both in my book and um, in the talk is that when you take about the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, when you, we say, yeah. Yeah, there's a variance about is Mary engaging in sin here or not. There is always an understanding. There's something very, very special about the Virgin Mary, something very special here in her holiness and the trajectory. When you go through the fathers trajectory goes towards the view of being free from sin. What does that mean? Still trying to understand it, but that's where the trajectory goes. So it, would, it wouldn't make sense to say the trajectory ends with, oh, a sinner, just like the rest of us. Yeah. What, what a really good point that you bring up there. You're, you're definitely correct there. And, and as you know very well, Trent, because you've done a lot of research in that particular field, <clears throat> you find it early on, and we talked about it earlier, very early on, you have fathers in the apostolic era, anti-Nicene, Nicene and on, that are calling Mary the new Eve, connecting Mary with that identity of the complete opposite of Eve, which is why I'm wondering if James really just didn't get the point you were trying to make at all, because the point you made was very clear for me. Um, right. You're not making the parallelism that Mary is going to go down that same path as Eve. Rather, she is the complete opposite of Eve. She gave birth to life. Eve may have given birth to death. Mary, as a father, say, gave birth to life. So they're really, I think James, I'm not sure. I want to be fair to him, Trip. Right. I'm not sure if he didn't get your point or if he's trying to really just be uh, difficult. I, I don't know, but I, I will say that, yeah, when you look at it, and this is something non-Christian, uh, sorry, non, non-Catholic scholars recognize. You look at the Anglican scholar J.N.D. Kelly. This is what he says about Augustine and Augustine's view of Mary's sinlessness. He says that Augustine, quote, denied the possibility for all other men, but agreed that Mary was the unique exception. She yep. had been kept sinless, However, not by the effort of her own will, but as a result of grace given her in view of the incarnation. And so th this is something that there's a lot of other work, of course, that has been done on this uh, amongst the patristics and the fathers. But we, as I said, we see the trajectory of understanding, just like you can argue the same thing in the first 300 years of Christianity. You have Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons who will take very early descriptions of the Trinity from Justin and from others yeah that should not be read rigidly because they did not have the yeah. theological vocabulary to articulate and say, oh, the, the Trinity just pops up later out of nowhere. No, there's a trajectory of understanding it, maybe in blunt ways early on, but then more refined ways later. And I would say it's the same in the Marian dogmas. That is a great point that you bring up there, Trent, because you're right. You have uh, Justin the Martyr, you've got other, other figures in, in early church history where if, if you think you're going to open up his dialogue to Trifo and find an exposition on the Trinity, as you would then later find it post-Nicaea, I mean, you've got a clear problem there. Um, again, you bring up a really good point when it comes to Mary. You've got a lot of early fathers indicating that they believe Mary was created completely pure, but they don't go into the technical language we'd find later fathers go into. But right. you have that kernel of truth right there at a very early church, a very early period in church history. And I think that is a big problem with what James is putting forth. And right now, we're eventually going to get to, I, think, I believe, his final quote, where 
I think it really highlights the major problem because we're about to hear he'll briefly touch upon St. Ephraim, which, by the way, masterful, you bringing that, that quote up. Yes. And I have to be quite honest, Trent. And if, if you have had a, a different experience with James, you can let me know. But I get the idea that James has not really done a lot of research on this in this particular field, in particular with the Syriac uh, church fathers, because he seems totally confused by it and doesn't get the point you were trying to make with your quote from Ephraim. Yeah, well, I, I say we just why don't we just play it and then we you can you can see what what conclusion he draws from it. Yep. Problems or something that was missed that creates a, a new parallel that would demonstrate something about Mary you don't want to prove about Mary, whatever. What they're trying to do with something like that is, oh, see, there is no stain in thy, mo mo thy mother. Therefore, she was immaculately conceived and she was sinless in her life. Well, maybe someone by then had dreamt up something like that, but maybe not. I mean, utilizing flowery language of people, you know, I, I mean, today someone says of, uh, well, the NBA finals, I guess, are going on right now. I wish I could be excited about them. I live in Phoenix and I was here in 93 and it was exciting in 93 because anyway, that'd be like saying Chris Paul had a perfect game. Well, wait a minute. Um, Actually, he had a turnover. Uh, he missed 35% um, of his shots. Uh, he missed two free throws. Um, it wasn't actually perfect. And the person I go, well, duh, I know that that's not what a perfect game means. I was saying is he was dominant. He, he came through in the clutch. Da, 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 da. But as long as you want to, as long as you have a context that you're willing to import into the words, then, ah, here was someone who was well, that's Let's jump in. And, and that is the key. What is the context? What are these yeah. people, what are these fathers talking about? Because James's own analogy works against him, actually. For example, if I say that a, a bowler, B-O-W-L-E-R, someone who goes bowling, if I said that a bowler had a perfect game, what that means is that not a single pin was left standing. It was like 300, I think, in a... Uh, yeah. when, you're, when you're bowling 300, you know, 300 or um, a pitcher had a perfect game. A pitcher has a perfect game when none of the balls are hit. It's a shutout when not a single ball is hit. It's a perfect game. So actually, you're right. We can use it in a more elastic sense, but we can also use it in a in a strict sense. So uh, so I would say, well, what are the fathers when they're talking about Mary? That she's perfect, that she's she's incorruptible. You know, they compare her to the Ark of the Covenant, and I think you might have we might have missed this part. But he he talks about a typology. Oh, you know, you're comparing to the Ark of the Covenant, and you right. can't do that to me. And I will give you this, William. I myself, I'm kind of a skeptical person in general, which I think is good as an apologist because you don't want to. You got to have really good strong evidence. Yeah. And sometimes I'll hear a typologic an argument from typology. And I'll say, eh, maybe, like kind of a loose connection there. <laughs> so I already, some typological arguments, I'm kind of like, all right, it's not the strongest I would prefer to have. And so I'm already predisposed, like I'm a little skeptical. But when you read uh, about the, the, Ark of the, the Ark of the Covenant and the parallels to, um, and the parallels to Mary, uh, for example, when you're, you're looking at uh, how, you know, David says, how does the, that, that the Ark of the Lord should um should come to should come to me he says yes. that and then elizabeth says of mary how is it that the mother of my lord uh comes to me it talks in the old testament it talks about how uh david leapt before the ark of the covenant john the baptist leaps before mary the ark of the covenant dwells for three months in a particular individual's house mary dwells for three months uh in the house of elizabeth and to me yep. i'm like wow this is this is more than coincidence uh, just for me to see. And of course, if the, it makes sense, the ark contained the word of God. John is very clear. Jesus is the word. And the ark was something that was pristine. You couldn't, if you were not the high priest and you touched it, as Uzzah learned in the Old Testament, when the ark was being steadied on an ox cart, he was yep. struck down. Struck down. Uh, it, it, it 
point for point, it it all adds up to me. And to just say, oh, that, that's not there. I'm like, well, I I think that's a it's a willingness, like a willful blindness to what the parallels we are seeing in salvation history. I, I totally agree with you, Trent. I think you, that is a very good point there. The the incredible parallelism that parallelism that we find in the, when we read about Mary as a new ark. It's not a mere coincidence. All those Greek words utilized there, uh, the, uh, the the terminology utilized for Mary, and the fact that you find so many early fathers making that connection, it, it can't be a mere coincidence. But I think another another flip side to the to me, a big problem that does work against James is, as you pointed out, Trip, the context. Because I, I would bet you anything, James White is doing these review videos uh to myself, to you, and I don't think he's doing any homework because he had he read the Nisabine Hymn 27, which I admit to you, it's a very hard one to find the full thing in English. Right. Uh, I've got I've got a very good brother of mine, uh, my friend Elijah, who provided me that translated from a Syriac Christian to English the whole thing. And if you read the context right there, Trent, it's what what does it mean when it says Mary has no stain? or no spot. It's talking about any spot of sin. It's making that clear right. connection. But before that, Trent, Ephraim is talking about the fall. And if Mary is clearly not part of fallen humanity, what logical conclusion can we make? I mean, to me, that is the biggest problem that James says, well, it's just flowery language. No, the context is very clear that Ephraim's yeah, making it. And I could see how this would um, happen to him. And I agree with you. Like, it can be hard to, for, for some of the fathers, for example, when I'm doing my research, a lot of them have been translated and put on a site like New Advent or, yep. in, or the Shaft Collection or there are other collections of the fathers. There are some writings of the fathers, though, some of the writings of Origin, for example, that were just recently translated. I've had to get special monographs from Catholic University of America to yeah. find uh, like that. Like uh, I cite the Nisabine hymns 27, eight, but even that in my own book, that's a citation from O'Carroll's uh, theological encyclopedia, the blessed yeah. Virgin Mary, which is a great book. And it's a very trustworthy secondary source, but it's always like the more you can get back to the, the primary sources. I know you've done this with uh, documents related to, uh, the canon of scripture in yep. the, the fourth century, you've done that masterfully. I want to get a hold of the primary sources you have on that. When you start forget, with you. Yeah, exactly. I'm happy to do this is what's great to be <laughs> comrades in all of this. Uh, but that's, what's important that you have people who are making these arguments. And uh, a lot of times they're taking a secondary anti-Catholic source that's citing yep. a secondary Catholic source. Yep. That's go that's citing a long, a more obscure primary source always whenever you're doing research go to the primary source when you, have you can to. you have yeah. to which is a really good point that you bring up there and then people are wondering well william uh, how much uh, syriac do you know nothing i don't know any but i've got a very good friend of mine he's a chaldean catholic and i'm very good friends with that uh, with uh dr brock dr brock every time before uh, in fact, um, I'm very proud to say he uh, he gave a formal endorsement of uh, the book that I co-authored with my friend Father Coppice. And he's not even a Catholic, the book on Mary, and he's not even a Catholic. We would reach out to him to verify certain quotes. And I want to point out one thing. Uh, Dr. Brock, who's not Catholic, plain, plain, uh, plain and simple, told us, look, Ephraim does not use the kind of dogmatic language you find today. But Ephraim would have never, ever taught that Mary had a fallen nature or that Mary was sinful. That was the furthest thing from his mind. And that, Trent, I think that is where we're at. When we look at the kind of language being utilized by the fathers, we eventually get to a time period where the church is using language that is developed more and they're, they're, they're providing us with better and clearer definitions. And I think that really is something that James... Look, James not only doesn't have that, James doesn't have any kernel of truth to the core beliefs of his sola scriptura, sola fide in the early church. You don't find any, even a kernel of that there. Right. Yeah. You you find things that can be read in that way. Right. Uh, you, you find the fathers talking about the importance of faith, uh, find the fathers talking about yep. how scripture can be used uh, to settle controversies. 
Yep. Uh, and White has done this before, where he'll say, oh, well, you can find, at the very least, you can find the bedrock of Sola Scriptura, even if you can't find the full doctrine in the fathers. Because look, the fathers use scripture. They say, let it, let scripture decide this dispute between us. Yeah. You know, they say, why don't they rely on tradition? Well, they're arguing with heretics. Just yeah. like when I argue with a Protestant or, you know, dialogue or debate with a Protestant today or with a Mormon or, or a Muslim, whoever it may be, I'm not going to say, well, he, the church teaches X because they don't do with that authority. I'll go to common ground. So if it's with a Protestant, I'll say, all right, well, what does scripture say? And we will we'll, we'll go there. And the fathers do the same thing. But you can read from there talking about, hey, look, even from scripture, you can see the, the truths of our faith. They would not have taken from that the 16th century doctrine of Sola Scriptura. No, no, they really, they really would not have. But um, look, I hate to underwhelm people that are watching. There really wasn't a whole lot of substance to the video. There really was not a whole lot of it. Um, and, and that is what we find very often. Uh, there there a, is stuff, though, I will say that a person who is not familiar with these things oh, yeah. would maybe be jostled to say, oh, I hadn't heard about this problem yeah. or, yeah, what about that? And that's why people like like you, William, and like myself, we just try very hard. Hey, here are the facts. Here's the research. Yep. And we want to present it in a charitable way. And we're happy to engage critics and the, and the arguments they have. No doubt. And we've even more than one time, we've even told them we are more than happy to debate. Yeah. More than absolutely. happy. We're, we're here to debate uh, the challenges out there. Uh, Trent, you've been incredible this evening. Do you have any, any – um, look, before we leave – Plug anything you're working on, brother. What are you working on? Are you working on a book? Any talks? Uh, Where can people find you? Yeah, well, I, I'm wrapping up one manuscript. I'm eager to start another one, but I'm wrapping up one. It's a it's a it's my first dialogue book, like a Peter Crafe dialogue book, but it's a dialogue with my inner skeptic, and he doesn't always play nice. So uh -oh. um, so I think that'll be a fun try at a dialogue book. Um, otherwise, I'd recommend your listeners definitely check me out at the Council of Trent. You can find the podcast on iTunes, Google Play. And also my YouTube channel, you can go there. And if you like what William and I have done tonight, uh, I have other rebuttals that, that I have done on there of John MacArthur, Mike Winger, lots of other people you, you might really enjoy. Check that out. Just go look Council of Trent on YouTube and uh, subscribe there. Incredible, brother. And brother, I've had a great time talking with you. I look forward to dialoguing with you again and having you back on. I've had a great time talking to you, brother. Thank you much. You too, William. And keep up all your good work as well. It's nice to see someone else doing the rebuttals, doing the debates. We'll have Amen. to do this again sometime. We sure will, brother. You have a great evening. You too. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.